Yes, sir. sir. I, I am connected, connected Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you so much. And um, uh, Judge Garland, I want to say thank you to you for your willingness to to serve and for your career in public service. And I will tell you, as I've talked to Tennesseans about this, they care a lot about law, order, timeliness at the Justice Department. And uh, after the Christmas Day bombing, you and I discussed this and the bombing that took place in Nashville. They really are interested in the principles and the convictions of our nation's top law enforcement official. And my hope is, and I think the expectation is that you will assure the American people that you are going to apply the law fairly and equitably because in this country, as we know, no one is above the law. Now, I know you've been asked about the Durham investigation, and I will tell you that this is important to Tennesseans and making certain that that investigation is going to be completed and that you are going to work to be certain that it is not impeded and is completed and that you're committed to seeing this through to completion. Well, uh, thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity we had to discuss uh, uh, these matters um, uh, earlier as well. Um, as I said, with respect to the Durham investigation, I don't know anything about it other than uh, what has appeared in the media. Um, the investigation has been uh, discreet with, uh, as appropriate uh, with respect to expressions of, the, of its status. Um, I understand that Mr. Durham has um, uh, been permitted to remain uh, in his position, and I know of nothing uh, that would give me any doubt that that was the correct uh, decision. And, and I, I appreciate, appreciate that, that. And likewise, likewise we, we had discussed, discussed the investigation, investigation into, into Hunter, Hunter Biden's business dealings. And uh, we want to make certain that you commit to allowing Delaware U.S. Attorney David Weiss to complete that investigation and bring that evidence forward. And similarly with Mr. Durham, I don't know anything about uh, that investigation other than what I've read uh, in the um, uh, media. And again, that, dis that investigation has been um, uh, proceeding uh, uh, discreetly uh, and not publicly, uh, uh, as all investigations should. Uh, I understand that the Delaware uh, U.S. Attorney um, uh, was permitted uh, to stay on as the U.S. Attorney. And I, again, have absolutely no reason to doubt that that was uh, uh, their correct decision. And uh, let's talk a little bit about China because we discussed some of that for the record. And uh, our last DNI had stated that China is our greatest threat. So I would like to hear from you. Do you agree that the Chinese Communist Party is an enemy of the American people? Well, uh, I don't have the same familiarity uh, with the intelligence information that the uh, director of, the, of national intelligence has. So in terms of comparing, say, the threat from China and the threat from Russia, I'm just not competent uh, to make that. And I, that comparison, and I have learned uh, in my professional career not to make uh, judgments on which I am not uh, competent. But I uh, certainly, uh, from what the director said, uh, there's no doubt that, that uh, China is uh, a, a threat with respect to uh, hacking of our uh, computers, hacking of our uh, infrastructure, uh, theft of our intellectual uh, property. Um, um, uh, all of these are uh, very uh, difficult problems and uh, we have to defend against. Well, well we, we do. do. And, and I, I know, know that, that Lindsey Graham, Graham asked you about, about Section 230. 230 and some of the issues that are there. We all are very concerned about the issues that surround China, whether it is the Chinese Communist Party and their, the way they threaten our democracy and our economic leadership around the globe. And we're also concerned about uh, the Chinese military links into our American universities through things like the Confucius Institutes and for instance, 
Uh, recently, there was a situation at Harvard with a cancer researcher, and he was caught trying to smuggle 21 vials of biological material out of the U.S. and get it to China. And I would hope that you agree that this threat puts uh, American intellectual property and technology at risk. And I would hope that you would assure the American people that you're going to put the full force of the Department of Justice to forward to investigate and to prosecute every one of these spies that are working on U.S. soil. Well, well Senator, I'm, I'm not familiar with that circumstance, um, so I can't comment on it specifically, but I can assure you uh, that the Justice Department's National Security Division uh, was in, uh, created in part uh, for the purpose of ferreting out um, um, uh, espionage uh, by foreign agents, and that that is also the, uh, the role of the FBI and the two working together. And uh, if, if uh, uh, foreign agents are uh, caught uh, uh, stealing American intellectual property, American trade secrets, um, uh, American materials that they will be prosecuted. Yes, of course. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we're, we're about, about a year into this, this pandemic, pandemic and technology has allowed for us to do work like we in the Senate are doing with WebEx. Uh, I think we've all found that it gives a lot of flexibility, but um, as we are spending more time online, we hear from people about holding big tech accountable. As I said, you've discussed Section 2, 230 earlier, and we are hearing more about antitrust lawsuits. Of course, you all have the current suit against Google, and I will hope that you are going to allow that lawsuit to continue. Yeah, I don't. Again, I don't want to talk about a particular lawsuit, but um, I, I I don't see uh, you know every matter um, uh, I have to uh, ask uh, for a briefing on. Um, but uh, uh, much of that lawsuit uh, is public, and again, um, given what I've uh, read, I don't see uh, any reason why the, that investigation, uh, the decision to uh, to institute that investigation, uh, uh, would be changed. But I. I only know what I uh, what I've read with respect to uh, to the descriptions of the public filings. Let, Let me ask, ask you one, one more question, question and then, then I'm, I'm going, going to have a series of questions, questions to come to you as QFRs. Uh, the President Biden has talked about reinstating the um, Obama administration practice of paying settlement money from winning lawsuits to third party interest groups like. La Raza, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, and the Urban League. And it's just, you know, I, I, I find it really interesting that they would choose to have that money go to these outside groups instead of to victims or to the U.S. Treasury. So do you plan on reinstating that policy? And how would you justify reinstating that policy? I, I don't have any plan one way or the other. Um, um, I know you raised that, uh, that policy um, when we were talking before, and I, I understand uh, yeah. your concern about it. Um, obviously, um, damages, uh, recoveries should uh, uh, first uh, go to help uh, victims. I don't know uh, very much at all about uh, the policy, and uh, it would be something I would have to consider uh, if I'm confirmed, um, I have to hear the arguments uh, on both sides of uh, why the policy obviously started uh, and also why it was rescinded. Chairman, um, I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. And I'm going to do something I, I don't think I've ever done before in an opening statement. I'm going to read from uh, a couple of the individuals. Mr. Travis, Mr. Greenwald, had, I read their, their full statements last night, very compelling testimony. I'm going to read from part of those because I think they capture what, what the situation truly is. Let me start with Mr. Travis's written testimony. He says this, Algorithm, algorithms are designed by humans and the results are monitored. Facebook can make any site soar in popularity or crush their traffic and they can do it in an instant. This is the power of big tech writ large. We are living in a new gilded age where tech billionaires, maybe soon to be trillionaires, 
have more power than any elected official in the land. Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg, Twitter's Jack Dorsey, Apple's Tim Cook, Alphabet's Sundar Pichai, and Amazon's Jeff Bezos have more power today than Andrew Cargany, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, and Henry Ford ever did in the earliest days of the 20th century. These modern-day tech monopolists can pick presidential election winners, control our national debates, decide whose voice is heard, whose voice is not heard. The Supreme Court no longer decides what the law of the First Amendment is in this great country. These tech executives do. In practice, big tech controls the country, and they control the country by deciding what we see. Well said, Mr. Travis. I mean, if this doesn't underscore why we need to remove the liability protection in Section 230, I don't know what does. Mr. Greenwald makes many of the same points in his written testimony, and then he says this about the specific question at hand at this committee hearing today. He says, how Congress sets out to address Silicon Valley's immense and undemocratic power is a complicated question. Well, it is. Posing complex challenges. The proposal to vest media companies with an antitrust exemption in order to allow them to negotiate as a consortium or cartel seeks to rectify a real and serious problem. Very true. But, and this is important, but empowering large media companies could easily end up creating more problems than it solves. He goes on to say this, further empowering this already powerful media industry, which has demonstrated it will use its force to silence competitors under the guise of, quote, quality control, runs the real risk of transferring the abusive monopoly power from Silicon Valley to corporate media companies. And this last clause is important. Or even worse, encouraging some sort of de facto merger in which these two industries pool their power to the mutual benefit of each. We already saw that happen. We saw it last fall, in last fall's election. Both Mr. Travis and Mr. Greenwald cite this in their written testimony. Last fall, when big media teamed up with big tech to make sure the American people didn't hear about the Hunter Biden story in the weeks leading up to a presidential election. So we've already see them, seen them team up against we the people. And now we have legislation that's going to give big media this consortium and cartel power. At the same time we're looking to use antitrust law to deal with big tech, we're going to give an antitrust exemption to big media. Maybe that's the right course, but I got, a, I got real questions about that whether we should move in that direction. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. I want to thank him again for coming, particularly Mr. Travis, who traveled here in person. I appreciate um, his good work, and we look forward to um, a chance to hear from uh, each of our witnesses, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I yield back. Is Mr. Scalise here? Thank you. Uh, there we yeah, go, thank Steve. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for having this here. I want to thank our three witnesses uh, for coming as well. Clearly, uh, you're seeing a lot of concern being expressed by members on both sides, both Republican and Democrat, about the way that your social media platforms are run, and especially as it relates to the, the fairness and, and equal treatment of people. I, I know I've had a lot of concerns, uh, shared it with some of you individually over the last few years, about whether it's algorithms that seem to be designed uh, sometimes to have an anti-bias against conservatives. Uh, but look, we all agree that uh, whether it's illegal activity, bullying, those things ought not be uh, permeated through social media. But there's a big difference uh, between uh, stopping bullying and, and violent type of social media posts versus actual censorship of political views that you disagree with. And, and I think I, I wanna ask my first question to Mr. Dorsey because there have been a lot of concerns expressed recently about that unequal treatment, and, and I'll just start with the New York Post article. I think a lot of people have seen this. This article was censored uh, by Twitter when it was originally sent out. This is the New York Post, uh, which is a newspaper that goes back to 1801, founded by Alexander Hamilton. And for weeks, this very credibly sourced article right before an election uh, about Hunter Biden was, was banned by Twitter. And then when you contrast that, you have this Washington Post article uh, that was designed to misportray a conversation between President Trump and the Georgia Secretary of State. Since been parts of this have, have been debunked, and yet this, this article can still be tweeted out. Uh, I want to ask Mr. Dorsey, uh, first of all, do you recognize that there is this real concern that, that there's an anti-conservative bias on Twitter's behalf? And, and would you recognize that uh, th this has to stop if the this is going to be, uh, Twitter is going to be viewed by both sides as, as a place where everybody's going to get a fair treatment. 
Yeah, we we made a total mistake with the New York Post. We we corrected that within 24 hours. It was not it was not to do with the content. It was to do with a hacked materials policy. We had an incorrect interpretation. Um, we we don't write policy according to any particular political leaning. If we find any of it, we write it out. But so we're regarding make, the Washington we'll make Post, mistakes. we will make mistakes, and our our goal is to correct them as quickly as possible. And in that case, we did. Mm -hmm. And I, and I appreciate you recognizing that was a mistake. However, the, the New York Post's entire Twitter account was blocked for about two weeks where they couldn't send anything out, not just that article. And uh, to censor, you know, we've got a First Amendment too. It just seems like to censor uh, a newspaper that's as highly respected as the New York Post. Again, 1801 founded by Alexander Hamilton uh, for their entire account to be blocked uh, for two weeks by a mistake. Uh, seems like a really big mistake. Was anyone held accountable uh, in, in your censoring department uh, for that mistake? Well, we don't have a censoring department, um, but I, I agree. Um, like it, well, it, who made the decision then to block their account for two weeks? We, we didn't block their account for two weeks. We required them to delete the tweet and then they could tweet it again. They didn't take that action, so we corrected it for them. That was that Even was, though the tweet was accurate. I mean, are you, are you now, look, the, you've seen the conversations on both sides about Section 230, uh, and, and there's going to be more discussion about it, but uh, you're acting as a, a publisher. If you're telling a, a newspaper that they've got to delete something in order for them to be able to participate in your account, I mean, don't you recognize that that you're no longer hosting a town square? You're acting as a publisher when you do that. It, it was it was literally just a process error. Um, this, this was not against them in any particular way. We require if we remove a violation, uh, we require people to correct it. We change that based on um, they're not wanting to delete that tweet, which I completely agree with. I see it, but it is it is something we learn. Like we learn. Okay, well, let me go to the New York. Now let me go to the Washington Post article because this article can still be tweeted. I don't know if it was ever taken down. It contains false information. Even the Washington Post acknowledges that it contains false information. Yet there are tweets today on your service that still mischaracterize it in a way where even the Washington Post admitted it's wrong, yet those mischaracterizations can still be retweeted. Will you address that and start taking those down to reflect what even the Washington Post themselves has admitted as is, is false information? Our, our misleading information policies are focused on manipulated media, public health, and civic integrity. That's it. We, we don't have a job. Well, I, I, I would hope that you would go and take that down. And look, I know you said in your opening statement, Mr. Dorsey, that Twitter is running a business and you said, quote, a business wants to grow its customer, the, the customers it serves. Just recognize if you become viewed and uh, continue to become viewed as an anti-conservatively biased platform, there will be other people that step up to compete and ultimately take millions of people on Twitter. I would hope you recognize hey. that. And, and I would yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Gentlemen's Chairman. time has expired. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to add my voice to the objections raised by Senator Corn and Senator Lee about scheduling a panel of five witnesses, one of which is a lifetime judicial appointment, the other four of which are very important appointments to the executive branch. Senator, would you allow me to respond be, and not at Please. the expense of your time? Please. Senator, in the last Congress, on the following occasions, we had one court nominee followed by a second panel with five nominees, judicial and executive nominees. October 4th, 2017, December 13th, 2017, May 9th, 2018, June 6th, 2018, August 22nd, 2018, October 17th, 2018, May 22nd, 2019, December 4th, 2019. These panels included lifetime appointees, and uh, as you can see in eight different occasions under Republican leadership, they had exactly the same format as today. No time like the present to change our ways. And since a, as a new member of the committee, I'm observing that I don't think that we should have four important executive branch nominees in front of us at a time. But thank you. Uh, Mr. Chipman, you testified to Senator Lee that it's a serious felony to lie on a background check application. I agree. Uh, the ATF form 4473 asks, are you an unlawful user of or addicted to any drug or uncontrolled substance? If an applicant checks yes, they cannot purchase a firearm. On March 25th, Politico reported that Hunter Biden, President Biden's son, applied for a handgun that was later thrown in the trash and had to be recovered by Secret Service agents in 2018. Politico reported that Hunter Biden completed this background check and answered no to the question 
of whether he was an unlawful user of or addicted to any drug. Hunter Biden has since published a book and gone on a nationwide book tour, conducting numerous interviews, stating that he was, in fact, very much addicted to drugs at the same time that he purchased this firearm. This would mean that by his own admission, Hunter Biden lied on that form and by your earlier testimony, committed a serious felony. Should Hunter Biden be prosecuted for breaking this law? Senator, uh, thank you for your question. Um, if I'm confirmed as ATF director, it will be my responsibility to enforce all federal laws without political favor. Um, I do not know any factors um, uh, in this particular case, but I am familiar what, uh, with the press account of it. Well, my understanding is the statute of limitation is only five years and that this happened in 2018. Mr. Biden is obligated to keep a record of that form for up to five years himself. So this should be a fairly easy case to investigate. Can I get your commitment that if you are confirmed, you will in fact look into this matter and refer it for prosecution if you find that Hunter Biden violated the law? Senator, um, what I will assure you is that if ATF director, um, I will ensure that all violations of law are investigated and referred. Um, I'm not sure that it has not been investigated. Well, I hope it has, and if the facts are as clear cut uh, as they appear to be based on Mr. Biden's own admission, I would expect to see criminal charges forthcoming. Um, but I would say that when a case is as high profile as this, if there is not an answer for the American people in public, it severely undermines the confidence in our gun, gun laws, as well as the ATF and the Department of Justice, if there are not criminal consequences. I want to turn to a second matter now, Mr. Chipman. You have called for an assault weapons ban. I have a simple question for you. What is an assault weapon? Senator, um, an assault weapon would be, in, in the context of the question you asked, what Congress uh, defines it as. So you're asking us to ban assault weapons. We have to write legislation. Can you tell me what is an assault weapon? How would you define it if you were the chair, the head of the ATF? How have you defined it over the last several years uh, as your role as a gun control advocate? Um, Senator, um, if I'm confirmed as ATF director, um, you know, my recollection is the only um, um, process but by which ATF is weighed in is that I know there's a demand letter three program which requires multiple reports, uh, multiple sale reports on the southwestern border. And ATF in that program has defined an assault rifle as any semi-automatic rifle capable of accepting a detachable magazine um, above the caliber of 22, which would include a 223, which is you know, largely the so, AR-15 round. So you, you believe that every weapon that takes a detachable magazine that can take a 22 round or, or 556 in the military parlance should be defined as an assault weapon? Um, let me clarify. Uh, what I believe I just said is any semi-automatic rifle. Um, okay, any semi-automatic rifle. Um, what, what? That's the definite. A detachable magazine that takes a 556 or 22 round should be defined as an assault weapon. S Senator, um, you asked me um, if ATF um, had uh, used this term and I was sharing with you my knowledge of a program in which ATF has defined this term. Um, and it is in the demand letter three program. And that rifle is a semi-automatic rifle capable of accepting a detachable magazine with a round greater than a 22 caliber. And in those cases, firearms dealers on the Southwest border are required to make a multiple sale report to ATF. I, I'm, I'm amazed that that might be the definition of assault weapon, that would basically cover every single modern sporting rifle in America today. Um, let me put it this way. If, if I wanted to buy an assault weapon and I walked into Walmart or Cabela's or some other firearm dealers and I looked up on the wall where they were labeling their weapons, would there be a label on the wall for assault weapon? Um, I don't believe, um, Senator, and thank you for this question, that the firearms industry has used the term assault rifle in their marketing um, since there was a ban on it. Uh, it was after that that they changed uh, their use of the term assault rifle to the modern sporting rifle. Well, so I've been in Walmarts and I've been in Cabela's and I've seen that you can find sections for, for pistols or handguns or for shotguns or for rifles because those are actual kinds of firearms. I think our exchange here illustrates 
that there really is no such thing as an assault weapon. That is a term that was manufactured by liberal lawyers and pollsters in Washington to try to scare the American people into believing that the government should confiscate weapons that are wildly popular for millions of Americans to defend themselves and their families and their homes. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hirono. One minute. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I want to take one second to congratulate Jake Easley on his election to Congress, but it brought two people back together. Mike Garcia and Jake actually served our nation earlier before they served in this body. He flew F-18s off an aircraft carrier into Iraq. They were brothers, and now they're back together again, serving their nation and putting it forth. It might be a little ironic that they both came in in a special election. They both were turning points on those elections, and I would say underdogs in those elections. But it shows they both graduated from the Naval Academy, served their nation, and continue to serve again. This is a good day in this House. Madam Speaker, one week ago, President Biden said inflation was temporary. He went on to say that spending trillions more would, and I quote, reduce inflation, reduce inflation, reduce inflation. Madam Speaker, I think he's the only one who believes that. Mr. President, with all due respect, we need to wake up. Inflation has risen every single month since you took office. And last month was the largest increase in 13 years. Now, let's be very clear. Inflation is a tax on every single American. Everyone who's buying grocery knows it. Everyone who is filling up their car knows it. Everyone who is booking a summer flight knows it. And yet President Biden told a town hall in Ohio last week, I don't know anybody who's worried about inflation. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the only people I could imagine who are not worried about inflation make $5 million in a couple months on trading stock options or sell paintings for half a million dollars. Why doesn't the President of the United States know what's going on? This is what Americans hate about Washington. They turn on the TV and hear the President telling them their concerns aren't real. Enough is enough. People are fed up with the ignorance and arrogance and the hypocrisy. Madam Speaker, President Biden needs to get a clue about inflation. And it's not just Republicans who have been warning the Democrats if they passed the bill, it would bring inflation. And here it is. It was Democrats who served in the Obama administration and Clinton administration, who warned them if they spend more trillions, inflation will come. And it's come every single month. And what's their answer for the future? More trillions. They probably even try to call us back in August to make sure inflation grows a little more. If that's not enough, just yesterday, we missed every indication and every prediction for growth in America. Americans can't take this much longer. November can't come sooner. But inflation is a tax on every single American. But for those who don't know it, spend a little time with the real America, and you'll realize it. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Buck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General, I'd like to direct your attention to the easel behind me. Uh, the first painting is a Claude Monet. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't read any of the words. You don't need to. Okay. You just need to look at this great painting right here. It's a very here. beautiful painting. It is beautiful, and uh, it is listed at Christie's for $700,000. Uh, now, Claude Monet was uh, the founder of the Impressionist uh, movement, something I didn't know until I researched it. Um, the second painting is a Degas, it, uh, another world-renowned artist, and this painting sold for $500,000. The third painting, you may recognize this name, is a Hunter Biden. I don't, I don't recognize the painting. The Hunter Biden painting sold for $500,000 also. Now, you may think that such an exclusive, um, that, that when Hunter Biden is in such exclusive company, that he would have a background, you know, artistic training, for example. Um, but you would be wrong if you thought that. 
And you might think that he had some sort of apprenticeship with a world-renowned artist, but you would be wrong again if you thought that. Or perhaps that he has been selling his works for years, and again, unfortunately, you would be wrong. It turns out that in 2019, Hunter Biden couldn't find a gallery to list his art. And what happened in 2020 that changed all that? His dad became president of the United States. Now, a single piece of art from Hunter Biden sells for more than the average American home. This art arrangement is so suspicious that the Obama administration ethics czar, Walter Schaub, tweeted on July 10th of this year, Hunter Biden should cancel this art sale because he knows the prices are based on his dad's job. Shame on POTUS if he doesn't ask. Selling fakes or selling or having a fake skill set is nothing new to Hunter Biden. When his dad was vice president, Hunter Biden received $50,000 a month from a Ukrainian oligarch to sit on a board of an energy company. What was Hunter Biden's background in energy? Nada, nothing, zilch. Soon after he received his dad, um, soon after he and his dad got off Air Force Two in China, Hunter Biden became a private equity guru and assisted with a Chinese private equity firm linked to the Chinese Central Bank. You might ask what his background was with Pacific Rim Investments or the Chinese Central Bank. Nothing. <laughs> with his dubious track record, inquiring minds might question why any art gallery would want to sell Hunter Biden's art. Well, this particular art gallery had its COVID relief loan more than doubled by the Biden administration. In a survey of more than 100 art galleries in New York's 10th Congressional District, this particular art gallery received by far the largest SBA disaster loan. And as an aside, Mr. Attorney General, the member who represents the 10th Congressional District is none other than Chairman Nadler. Mr. Attorney General, who buys Hunter Biden's art? Who benefits? What benefits do they receive from the Biden administration? The American people want to know. I have sent a letter to the Department of Justice before your tenure asking them to appoint a special counsel to investigate Hunter Biden. I have uh, today sent a letter to you, and I am asking you uh, now, will you appoint a special counsel to investigate Hunter Biden? I'm not, uh, for the same reason that I'm not um, able to respond to questions about investigations of the former president, or of anyone else, I'm not unable, able to discuss uh, any investigations pending or otherwise with respect to any uh, citizen of the United States. Mr. Mr. Uh, Attorney General, I worked for the Department of Justice for 15 years. You are allowed to tell us whether you will appoint a special counsel. You may not tell us whether you are uh, investigating or not investigating a particular matter, but you are allowed to tell us whether you will appoint a special counsel, and that's my question. Well, I, apparently I just received the letter today from you, and uh, we'll be taking it under advisement, but I, I wasn't aware that you had sent me a letter. Okay, I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back, but I would like to first place into the record two articles, uh, one from Vox, why Obama's former ethics czar is highly critical of Hunter Biden's lucrative art sales, and the second from the New York Post, art galley repping Hunter Biden received 500,000 federal COVID loan records show. Without objection. Today, I'm going to highlight a new Hunter Biden record that I've recently made public. Before I get to that point, I'm going to take a trip down memory lane. Yes, down memory lane. On September 23rd, 2020, Senator Johnson and I released to our quote unquote, Biden report, as it has been called. That report folks focused on questionable financial transactions between the Biden family and foreign government linked individuals. On November the 18th, 2020, we released a supplemental to that report. I'm going to read several statements from the media and my Democrat colleagues about our report. So, start with September 23rd, 2020, a New York Times article by Nicholas Flandos, 
described it in two ways. Quote, lack of meaningful new information, end of quote. And, quote, overlap with Russian disinformation campaign, end quote. And then Democratic Minority Leader was quoted in the same article and said the report read, quote, as if Putin wrote it, not United States Senators, end of quote. On September 23rd, 2020, Salon article by Igor Dershis quoted a Democratic senator saying that the report was the culmination of a, quote, sham investigation, end quote. In that article, the same Democratic senator described our investigation as being, quote, rooted in diff's information, end quote, from Russian operatives. Separately, a Democratic senator also said about our report, quote, bottom line, the Johnson-Grassley investigation is baseless. It's laundering Russian propaganda for circulation in the U.S., end quote. On September 23rd, 2020, CBS article by Melissa Quinn, Another Democratic senator said about our report, meaning the Johnson-Grassley report, quote, the chairman have amplified a known Russian attack on our election, end quote, and, quoting again, it is unconscionable that the chairman are continued to advance false information intended to undermine our democratic process at the expense of bipartisan work that we should be doing to protect our national security, end quote. That same CBS article said that our report, quote, reveals little new information, end of quote. And one Washington Post columnist, Josh Rogan, said, quote, even after accepting disinformation from Russian agents, Johnson and Grassley couldn't come up with anything new or interesting on Hunter Biden, end of quote. So, understand this. Week after week, month after month, year after year, the media and my Democrat colleagues falsely attacked our investigation with reckless disregard for the truth. I've spoken at length on the Senate floor rebutting all these false charges with example after example. I did so on May the 11th, 2021, March the 18th, 2021, December the 14th, 2020, December the 10th, 2020, October the 19th, 2020, and September the 29th, 2020. Well, on November the 15th this year, Senator Johnson and I publicly released a record that I placed in part on this poster next to me, and I'll get to this in a minute. The full document illustrates an assignment and assumption of business interest. The part next to me is a signature block in unaltered form, including one typographical error. The signature block includes Hunter Biden, two of his companies, and individuals connected to the communist Chinese regime. There are, these are the main companies that Hunter Biden and his associates use to funnel money all over the world. Hudson West 3, Hudson, uh, 
Hudson 5, and then the other ones are uh, Coldwater Harbor Capital and Owasco. Owasco is Hunter Biden's firm that was a recipient of millions of dollars from questionable financial transactions. Go win Dong. This gentleman here is the uh, was the right hand man for the owner of a company called CEFC China Energy Company. Merwin Yang was his associate. CEFC was an arm of the Chinese government. Hunter Biden was a close business partner of these men and their companies. Therefore, this signature block shows a direct financial and legal relationship between Hunter Biden and individuals connected to the communist regime. Now, these are the same folks and companies that we discussed at length in our September 2020 report. This new document is yet another record that substantiates our report that we issued September 2020. That same report that the media and my Democrat colleagues said was based on Russian disinformation. So I now say to the media, and I now say to my Democrat colleagues that said that our report was Russian disinformation. This question, is this signature block Russian disinformation? Are the names of these companies Russian disinformation? Is this document disinformation? No, this is a legitimate record that my staff uncovered and it didn't come from the Hunter Biden laptop. This is the same type of record that Senator Johnson and I based our report several months ago on. So, to my Democratic colleagues who falsely smeared our report, you're in the majority. You are now committee chairs and that you have jurisdiction over these matters. So I want to challenge you to use the same effort and energy that you exerted in the Trump-Russia investigation to expose the extensive ties between the Chinese regime and members of the Biden family. And I think I speak with some credibility on this point because you know there was a President Trump and at the time there was a President Trump, I investigated Donald Trump Jr. on things that were appropriate at that time to ask legitimate questions about in the congressional role of uh, congressional oversight, the constitutional role of congressional oversight. Now, on another matter, and this will be my last statement for the day, I've always been a critic of one-size-fits-all government. And there are a few places where this is more inappropriate than education. Each child is different. And if we offer a cookie-cutter assembly line education, it will hurt all students. Whether we're talking about students with gifts and talents, or those with learning disabilities. Students with unique learning needs must have teachers trained to address their way of learning. It may seem like common sense to say that, that students benefit when their education is tailored to their individual needs. Any parent can tell you that. 
You can't expect all students to learn at the same speed and depth in every subject. Unfortunately, those like outgoing New York Mayor de Blasio want to scrap programs for gifted students, citing the fact that white and Asian students were overperforming compared to students from other ethnic categories. De Blasio tried to end the city's program. His focus on maintaining equality of outcomes by preventing any students from excelling is a misguided policy. It would have the perverse effect of reducing opportunity for every student, for the very students who need it most, including historically disadvantaged minority groups. Now, we all know that wealthy families can afford to put their kids in private schools or pay for services outside the schools. It is those students who aren't as well off. It's the students that aren't well off who need access to services to address their unique learning needs. Families from less advantaged backgrounds are not helped by limiting opportunities for all students in public schools. They're the ones who have the most to lose when public schools cancel needed services. Thankfully, the incoming New York mayor recognizes the importance of gifted and talented program and has pledged to keep it. I introduced the Talent Act to address these unique needs of gifted and talented students and ensure that they don't slip through the cracks. Thankfully, much of this bill was included in Every Child Achieves in the year 2015. But I'm also a strong supporter of the Javits Gifted and Talented Education. This is the, is the only dedicated federal program to develop and help teachers implement teacher teaching methods that meet the needs of gifted students. And it is targeted specifically to disadvantaged gifted students. Thankfully, my state of Iowa is a leader in this area. Iowa law requires gifted education services for kids who need to be challenged. This applies to all students whether or not they can afford private schools. Iowa has recognized that we should aim to challenge kids with gifts and talents and give them the resources that they need to excel. We should help all students achieve their potential, not try in vain to find one identical education for every kid. I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. I reserve, yes. Gentleman from uh, Kentucky is recognized. Mr. Speaker, every time the uh, chairman Schiff rises to speak on a bill about intelligence and security and holding the president accountable, I get excited hoping that we're going to hear about that evidence of collusion and all the other investigations that were conducted in this House over the past year. I'll yield back, absolutely. Gentlemen, yield. Will the gentleman yield? Yes. Yield. Well, let me ask the gentleman: Are you aware, just by way of illustration, that the president's campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, secretly met with an agent of Russian intelligence and provided Russian intelligence with internal campaign polling data, as well as strategic insights about their strategy in key battleground states? Are you aware of that? I think everyone's aware of every bit of information that you all have tried to peddle over well, the past let, let four years. Let me ask you, are you aware that while the Trump campaign chairman was providing internal polling data that uh, Kremlin intelligence was leading a clandestine social media campaign to elect Donald Trump? Are you aware of that? I think we see every day Facebook just announced that uh, Russia was uh, trying to do a, a Facebook campaign in Ukraine, if I remember reading that correctly. Uh, Mr. 
shift. And would, would, would you, you like you me to yield go on? To a question would you like for me? Would you like me to go on? What would you yield to a question? Well, I'm asking you. Would you like me? To, you asked me to present you yeah. with some of the information. I, no, I about, think it's great. I, are you aware of? Uh, would, would you like Biden's me to continue? Hunter's art dealings. Would, would are the you gentleman like aware to? of the president's son's dealings with? Uh, in Congo with the uh, cobalt mine, well, it, it, are you, know, you to aware get to, of the dealings to get in to Ukraine? The, to get to the gentleman's question, I am aware of President Trump's son meeting secretly in Trump Tower in New York with a Russian delegation with the purpose of receiving dirt on Hillary Clinton, which the Russian delegation represented was part of the Russian government's effort to help elect Donald Trump in 2016. And I'm aware that Donald Jr., Donald Trump Jr., said in response to that Russian offer of dirt on Donald Trump's opponent that he would love it, suggested the best timing would be in late summer, uh, and had a secret meeting in Trump Tower. Uh, and when asked about that secret meeting, both the president and his son lied about it. Are you aware about those facts? I think that everyone's seen all the information, again, that you all have peddled. I, I'm, I'm curious if you would like would to you, take a like wager to, on who's... Would, which president's child, which president's son, at the end of the day, once we have the gavel, will have the most, will be the most security risk to so, our nation. So I'm, I'm happy to continue to outline the Aaron contacts Trump. between the Trump campaign and Russia, their solicitation of Russian help in the election, uh, the former president's effort to coerce Ukraine into helping him cheat in the election, I would happy to go uh, chapter and verse if you would like me to use your time that way. Right no, now, though, no. the subject of this amendment is to allow the uh, General Accounting Office, the GAO, to help Congress oversee well, aspects of the intelligence community. But, but if you're, time, if you're Speaker, more interested, I reclaim my time. We, we, the gentleman has reclaimed his time. Th they've spent a lot of time, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of tax dollars on trying to peddle a lot of wrongdoing in the previous administration. This bill is all about the previous administration. Every speaker on their side of the aisle has mentioned Donald Trump's name numerous times. Every speaker. It's time for the majority party to focus on governing and get over their obsession with Donald Trump. I reserve. 